So I will give 10 more seconds or so. Um, should I start now? Uh, not yet, uh, just okay. Wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ricardo. I've been um, partaking in the project uh, SEND um, Between Two Worlds, uh, Cyril Grange Between Two Worlds, um, and working together with, with everyone else. Um, and uh, today I will be hosting Eva Hoholova, um, who is a researcher uh, based um, on Masaryk University. Uh, Eva is finishing her PhD. Uh, on um, using uh, paleoproteomics and metagenomics. And tell us more about past populations. And so uh, thank you, Eva, for, 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 for joining us and for giving us um, uh, the pleasure of hosting you today. And well, uh, the, stage, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the invitation and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for listening uh, and making time this evening. Um, so the presentation, here we go. Okay, so my name is Eva Kukolova and I am from Masaryk University uh, from Laboratory of Biological and Molecular Anthropology. Uh, so we are um, located in a, in a city where Mendel lived. Maybe you know Mendel as, as the father of genetics. So I study genetics in the heart of Europe uh, where Mendel lived, which is uh, amazing. So we study genetics of past populations and uh, I focus on, on uh, dental calculus. So I want to take you uh, on a journey uh, into, uh, into dental cal calculus and to see what, what um, what, what it can show us uh, about our ancestors. So first, this is, this is our lab crew, uh, or now the lab crew is bigger, but <laughs> this is the last official photo we have. And, uh, and uh, on the top picture uh, in the right, uh, that's me in our laboratories. Uh, maybe you have uh, seen or probably all of us have seen uh, such clothing, laboratory clothing everywhere <laughs> in the recent months, but uh, it's not for COVID. It, this, this, uh, in this case, we, we have to work like this whole year around uh, to protect our samples from contamination. So it gets really fun in, in summer. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's, where I, that's where I work. So about dental calculus, uh, probably all of you have um, experience removing dental pluck from your teeth. In the past, it wasn't so common, I would say. Uh, so we find lots of dental calculus uh, on teeth of, of past populations. So plug after some time uh, mineralizes and turns into calculus. And uh, on, on, on the, um, at the picture on the right, you can see uh, how, how uh, the calculus looks when I uh, when I sample it um, from the historical population. So, so what what can we actually uh, find in dental calculus? First thing uh, that maybe comes to your mind are bacteria. Most of uh, dental calculus is made of bacteria, so the proteins and DNA and all that we find there, uh, or most of it, uh, is, is bacteria. Uh, as this picture shows, this is a picture I took uh, an electron microscope. You can you can see uh, some peaking bacteria and also uh, the holes that are left after decomposition of the bacteria. So we can we can study those uh, even by microscopy. And then uh, two very interesting groups of, of things that that get trapped inside calculus uh, are. Uh, any particles from environment, basically, uh, such as pollen, charcoal, and so on, and of course food, uh, because anything that enters our uh, oral cavity, our mouth, mouth can get stuck inside um, plaque and later be preserved in dental calculus. So, um, for example, 
we can study that by microscopy, uh, but also molecular methods. So uh, plant cells or pollen, these little spiky things are pollen. And it's very interesting because amazing paleobotanists can actually tell just by looking at the shape what, what kind of plant uh, it originates from, uh, which is amazing to me. <laughs> and uh, then, for example, uh, these are um, cotton fibers that were found in uh, Native Americans. And uh, in very interesting publication, uh, this, was, this was used to uh, study the trade um, in North America in the past. So uh, they, can, they could even find these fibers in dental calculus. Um, for example, my colleague, uh, Dana Fialova, she, she published an article where she focused on um, looking more into habits uh, of, of people just by uh, dental calculus. So for example, in the first picture, the, the, the A1, uh, this is from, uh, a, from a necropolis that, that is uh, like most studied by our laboratory, I would say. And uh, they found traces of uh, grinding stones uh, in the calculus. So we know that this population used uh, grinding stones uh, to, uh, to process their, their um, flour. So um, this, this was one more uh, evidence for that. Then there's this um, interesting uh, piece of gel where, where we can see it's, it's slightly greenish. Uh, and there, there weren't any grave goods, uh, grave goods like no, uh, I don't know, weapons uh, and, and stuff like that uh, found in this grave. Uh, but they studied the calculus by uh, EDX. So they, they looked at the um, uh, sample composition, like elemental co composition, and they found uh, traces of copper, which is why the green color. And uh, it actually looks that uh, in this grave, there were bronze grave goods, but that um, some, some like grave rubbers uh, took it before we could study, uh, we could study uh, this individual. So, so it was uh, an interesting case. And for me, the, the most interesting one is the last one, uh, because they found uh, men buried in the, in the middle of a small town in, in Czech Republic. And uh, in the local chronicles, it said uh, that there were some, um, some soldiers during 19th century buried, uh, but they weren't sure. It was just like something that um, the, the locals uh, kept telling uh, the next generations. And they found, you can see this hole between, between the front teeth, uh, which is not natural, <laughs> definitely. And it, it, uh, it is a result of some specific habit. And uh, they also found some uh, trauma that could be from uh, uh, of, a, of military origin. And in the dental calculus, they found uh, traces of uh, elements that are uh, results of gunpowder and bullet bullets. So uh, this guy probably opened paper cartridges that were filled with powder and bullet bullets um, uh, during uh, during war. So uh, he opened them with his teeth, and that's how traces of those elements got got on, uh, into his dental calculus. So. They actually, so, so my colleague can, uh, actually uh, brought the evidence that these were the soldiers that were from the local chronicles uh, from like 19th century, uh, 18th, 19th century-ish. Um, yeah, so uh, it's very interesting how, how much you can, you can find in dental calculus uh, even without uh, molecular analysis. Um, there's also part that comes from um, the individual himself. So uh, definitely mo all of you uh, had at one point in their life bleeding gums. So uh, blood and like all, all the um, let's say, uh, epithelial shedding uh, can bring your DNA and your proteins into dental calculus that we can then uh, study later. And all of this uh, is conserved 
by mineralization. So in microscope, we see plenty of crystals. It's very beautiful. I love doing uh, this kind of microscopy because it looks like walking on a moon. That's how I kind of imagine it. And you never know what you find. So I, I, I love it. Um, so that's, that's how we get to, to this dental calculus. And all of these, when they decompose, uh, leave molecular traces uh, that, that I personally study as a molecular biologist. And those are uh, ancient DNA and ancient proteins. Uh, so how, how do I actually uh, get to the results? Or like, what do I have to do? Uh, first, the first part is usually done by archeologists. Sometimes we, uh, we come to excavations as well. But uh, the ancient populations have to be first excavated. Sometimes we come in the uh, in a phase of um, just bones in boxes, unfortunately, because some of the excavations uh, took uh, took part like I don't know sixty years ago and so on. Uh, but sometimes we're lucky enough to to actually uh, come and help with the excavations uh, to do it in a sterile way and to uh, limit com uh, limit the, the contamination uh, because our samples are very prone to contamination. Um, then my role usually usually starts with sampling dental calculus and doing all the lab work. Uh, where I, I focus on uh, DNA, and I focused on DNA in the past uh, a bit more. Uh, I studied bacteria uh, a lot, and now uh, in my PhD, I uh, try to look more into proteins as well, uh, specifically because of diet and, uh, and a different way to look at pathogens. And all of, as you can see, all of these steps, and that's not even all the laboratory steps, like further on, uh, all of those can bring contamination that is very hard to solve uh, further on. Uh, so for example, we have to wear gloves all the time. And uh, even the sampling has to be in a very, uh, very covered uh, environment most of the time, or it should be <laughs> all the time. And uh, yeah, so contamination is our uh, probably most used uh, word <laughs> in our lab because we have to we, we have to prevent it at all times so that's why we work like this and no one ha no one can go into our labs unless they're dressed like uh, COVID doctors or something um, so first I want to say a bit about DNA because that's I know most uh, about, and it's it's very interesting. In most of the cases, you can you can study uh, similar things uh, from proteins. So, so yeah, uh, you can imagine when you uh, if, if we could look at the molecules inside the dental calculus, uh, you can imagine that all of this is DNA. Uh, it's it's what we call metagenome. Maybe you heard about like genomes. So that would be DNA from one person. Metagenome is all the DNA that we find in the sample. And to be honest, it's a mess. Like it's, it's everything's in there. And it's uh, not that hard to get the information out of the sample. It's crazy to look at all the information you get and to make sense of it. So that's most of my time <laughs> just looking at uh, stuff that looks like nonsense, but it's exciting. And uh, as, as I kind of said before, uh, this, is, this is the first study that was done uh, on, on such samples uh, by like for, for the metagenomics. And uh, most of the, the calculus in most individuals, it, it, it's not the case uh, every time, but most of the time, um, it's comprised of bacteria, like almost just bacteria. And if you look at this very minor uh, portion, uh, you can you can find other stuff like uh, animals and uh, animal and plant DNA. Uh, so the proteins that would be similar for, for proteins, uh, and we we want these these two mostly or even fungi uh, to be able to study uh, diet. So there's very little proportion of dietary molecules, uh, which I would think there would be more since like you, I don't know, 
like you eat a lot and not that much is stuck in in calculus it, it surprised me kind of <laughs> but that's how it goes so it's kind of complicated to get this information out and surprisingly enough even though the calculus spends months and years in in one's uh oral cavities there's very little uh human uh uh, like portion uh there can be more uh especially in in um, cases of some uh serious disease uh where yeah your lungs are falling apart <laughs> or something so then there could be more but um uh, but usually it's just bacteria or mostly bacteria so when when i look at uh at the uh ancient dna or adna detection uh as i said most uh, most of uh, of our problems will be coming from contamination because uh, ancient DNA is cut in small pieces because of um, deco decomposition by time, but contamination is usually not. So it's the easiest to uh, to find, uh, and uh, that's why we don't want to introduce any extra contamination. We already have enough from the soil and the handling in the last, I don't know, 50 years and so, so on. So sometimes we look at samples before we analyze them uh, by micro, uh, on like electron microscope to see if there's some visible contamination, just to give us a heads up uh, that this sample might be uh, slightly more difficult to analyze. So here you can see bacteria. Uh, there are some, some pieces of bacteria sticking out. You can see some crystals, some, some holes uh, that are left after bacteria. And then there's this chewing gum stringy thing. So that's what you get from mold, for example. Uh, and that's why it's very good to store samples in good depositories. Um, because it might be um, very complicated to get rid of uh, rid of some uh, yeah some of this DNA and so on. So uh, so we, you can you can look at these samples uh, heads of, ahead of time, uh, or also this this beautiful uh, almost necklace like thing uh, that's also contamination. It looks great under microscope, but we don't want it there. So. Uh, Okay, good, got stuck a bit. Uh, so when we want to study uh, more about the uh, human, that, like the individual uh, that was buried there, uh, we can look at mitochondrial DNA. Probably you, you heard about mitochondrial DNA, maybe in the context of mitochondrial Eve. Um, so it's, it's part of DNA that is inherited only from your mother's side. And that's why we can study uh, origins of, of people uh, all, all the way to history and to see uh, what, uh, what group uh, your ancestors were part of and how they migrated to where you currently live. So we can actually study that from dental calculus as well. It's a bit more complicated than if we studied it uh, from, for example, DNA that is found in, in teeth or uh, in bones, but it's possible. Uh, Usually we have to, uh, or we have to use uh, polymerase chain re reaction and some sort of enrichment. And uh, just just to uh, show you, um, just to, just to give you a picture, uh, there's very little human DNA in the calculus, as, as I said previously. So to study it, we have to um, either get rid of most of the other DNA or to amplify the piece that is interesting for us. Uh, so that's that's what we call enrichment. There are two strategies to doing that, or multiple, but this is the, the basic principle. So there's a very specific and very interesting case where, where it matters uh, and where it's very worth trying getting a mitochondrial DNA from calculus. And it's because it's less destructive. You don't have to sample any uh, like bones or, or teeth. Um, and in some cases, it can be seen as more ethical. For example, for uh, Native Americans, some, some of those populations can be studied uh, based on like um, anthropological and genetical record. Like we can, we can study uh, the archeology part of uh, things that were 
well, there are found there, uh, like ma ma material uh, stuff, but uh, because of the, yeah, just their descendants don't agree with, uh, with any sampling and, and any biological study like that. But dental calculus is seen as uh, uh, kind of okay and more ethical. So there are, uh, to my knowledge, at least two publications that use uh, calculus for this specific case, uh, specific case. And it's, uh, it's amazing that we can do that and that it, al it allows us to, to study more than we could uh, maybe previously. Uh, another thing is that, for example, I like to study bacteria and it's very interesting to, to see what pathogens looked like in the past and uh, what they look like now and maybe to see where they are going. Uh, so we can do that by so many different methods, but just uh, these uh, easy ones. It's again the polymerase chain reaction. So basically we're just out of one copy, we're making hundreds millions of copies uh, and you can imagine it like this so there's there's some uh, bacterial genes that we want to focus on so these little yellow guys and we can amplify it and then we can actually see it kind of uh, better by by our molecular biology methods so this has been done plenty of times uh, Usually we focus on the whole genomes of bacteria now, but in the past it was the easiest way and sometimes we still uh, kind of do it. So for example, uh, this study focused on, uh, on five different bacteria. And uh, again, my colleague, she studied caries and the uh, streptococcus mutans. So, so uh, bacteria again and how, how it's connected in these four, uh, four different locations that are very close by time and also by space, but still there were plenty of differences in, uh, in some of their diets and so on. So uh, she compared those, it's very interesting. Um, and then there's the like more current, like how, how it's done in the last, I would say decade, decade. Um, the first one, it's called 16S RDNA sequencing. It sounds super fancy, but what we do is uh, we, we study the metagenome as like all the DNA, but just the bacterial DNA, because this is something that bacteria have, uh, this, this gene. And we can actually look at all these yellow ones from all the bacteria. We sort them uh, and we, we compare them and we uh, have databases that allow us to assign them to specific bacteria, sometimes uh, not just like one, sometimes it's a, it's a bigger group, but still it helps us to see multiple bacteria uh, in, in single sequencing. It's, it's not focused on just one. Uh, so that's where the complicated bioinformatics uh, work starts uh, to make sense of it. But, but it's, um, it's great. Like, yeah, for example, this was part of my uh, diploma thesis and it's not even the craziest outcomes I got from it. So there's plenty, plenty, plenty of bacteria, plenty of pathogens. For example, I study um, one site uh, that is um, like mo most, most of the individuals found there were buried there because they died in a hospital. So it was used very often as, as a hospital cemetery. So perfect samples for studying pathogens uh, that, that um, were uh, killing our ancestors um, from like 13th to 17th century. And we can, we can look at how they changed uh, and how, uh, yeah, how, yeah, how different they are now that they used to be. So it's very interesting. And the second, second way to look at metagenome is shotgun sequencing. Uh, where we look at all of it, or like most of it, sometimes some, some pieces of DNA will fall out, uh, of course, uh, but, but we can look at the um, uh, other animal DNA, we can look at, uh, at um, plant DNA, viral DNA, and all of this. And uh, one of my favorite, uh, favorite papers on this is actually on Neanderthals. So we can study dental calculus of Neanderthals. Like there's not that, it's not that 
long time ago when we saw that near turtles were almost like chimpanzees with with these huge uh i don't know stone things that were threw at each other and still in Czech Republic I don't know how it's in, in Portugal but in Czech Republic we still have saying like you're behaving like such a near neanderthal like stop that you would say that to a kid and now we're finding out uh, how very cultured neander neanderthals actually were and it's also mm, thanks to calculus uh, we, we we see some um like maybe they use some medicinal plants and uh, and all of that stuff, and, and we can look at their diet, at uh, their disease, uh, and it's it's very fascinating what, what we can learn from from dental calculus uh, in Neanderthals. So mostly what what the study found was was bacteria, obviously as we as we saw, but they also found plants and they they found some uh, interesting uh, mammals uh, that were probably eaten by Neanderthals, I would say that they didn't just, I don't know, have pet rhinoceros, for example, that they could get uh, DNA from. Uh, but if you have dogs, you can have dog proteins and DNA in your calculus. So just watch out. Uh, so probably ate woolly rhinoceros uh, or mushrooms and plenty of other stuff. So, so it's very interesting what we, what we can see. Uh, and this was just DNA. Now imagine that proteins were kind of this side project and um, they were there. So, it, so everyone tried to sort it out somehow. And in the last years, it kind of overtook the DNA studies because it's, it's fascinating what you get, like how different information you can find in proteins. It's still in the same calculus. It's still from the same sources. Uh, but it gives us a whole new picture. Uh, just briefly, why proteins are different and why they give us different information than DNA. You can imagine that these are different types of cells. Like you are a mo mosaic of, of many types of, uh, of cells and each of them have a very different uh, function, very different like occupation in your body, what you're doing, uh, but all of them, uh, if I simplify it kind of, all of them have the same DNA. So if you ate a great steak uh, and it left traces of DNA from the cow in your calculus, all, all of that, you, when you drink, you could drink a bottle of milk at the end of the steak. I don't know who does that, but if you did, uh, we would get DNA from the milk and from the steak, but it would be still cow DNA. We, we couldn't like there's no way we could tell this DNA results from milk and this one is from something, something else. But what cells do uh, is that they produce different proteins uh, because DNA is like a cookbook. And imagine you, uh, you would find cookbook in different uh, archeological sites uh, in different times and it would be still the same cookbook. And you wouldn't know which families cho chose what kind of recipes. You wouldn't know what, what the result uh, what the result was, but uh, different cultures would understand that cookbook and the recipe is very differently. So it's the same with the cells. Uh, DNA is, is informative, but proteins can be even more informative in, in some ways, in some ways, in some DNA is better, but yeah, it's, it's complicated. So some of the proteins will be shared by all the cells, um, like basic stuff that you, the, the cell needs to survive, to work. But then there will be plenty uh, var variable uh, proteins that will be specific to the function. So for example, milk proteins won't be found in steak. They will be found, uh, find, uh, found, sorry, found only in milk or uh, cheese and, and stuff like that. Uh, on the contrary, uh, all the vegetarians don't have to be afraid that one day some archeologist will say that they ate cows because if they only drink meat, milk and the future archaeologist uses proteins, they won't find any uh, meat, uh, meat proteins, but they will find only the milk ones. So it's, yeah, perfect. <laughs> it's just very fascinating. And also another reason uh, why, why proteins are kind of preferred these days, I would say, or it depends on the laboratory, but yeah, it's turning there. Uh, it's because when you look at, at um, the set of DNA and a set of proteins in the same sample, 
over time, both of them will uh, decompose. They will get damaged by e even uh, after like a hundred years. Uh, like if you worked in forensics, even after a few hours of leaving a sample out on a window, it can get seriously damaged. So imagine studying uh, samples that are 50,000 years old and so on. So the DNA is very damaged. And after some time there might be there or not might be, there is no, no detectable DNA left. No, no DNA that we could actually study. Like we, we move the boundaries kind of. So uh, now it's uh, that we, we can study mammoths actually. That's the, the oldest uh, DNA sample, I believe one million year old. Uh, very recent publication, but for for proteins, it gets um, much older because they can survive so much more. Uh, so just uh, just a few uh, just a few examples of what you can study by uh, by the protein sentinel calculus. Uh, in this study, they study uh, not just pathogens but also uh, the host immunity. Because pathogens we could study by by DNA. Not, not like I, I don't want to say easily, but yeah, like we can get pathogens DNA uh, out of there. But for host immunity, we would just find the host DNA, the, the human DNA, but we, we couldn't say like what was happening there. But uh, if we look at the proteomic uh, makeup of the sample, uh, we can find that uh, the human body was resisting those bacteria, fighting with them and also with like viral infections and so on. And with some of the proteins, we can even say what kind of pathogens they, uh, the, the human fought. So we might not find the DNA or proteins of those pathogens, but we have evidence that the human was sick. So that's also what I'm working on right now, but it's not published yet. So <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> uh, another thing uh, very interesting is exotic foods, for example. Uh, this is from uh, Near East. And uh, in the study, they, they found new uh, and much older links between South Asia and Near East uh, and how they traded exotic foods. Uh, they looked at uh, sites of Megiddo and Tel Arani, and uh, they found some proteins that they would expect uh, that were quite usual in Southern Levant. Uh, but then some that are like typical South Asian uh, and that were thought to be part of trade only like thousands of years later. So fascinating. Uh, usually these studies check, um, uh, check the micro remains, like what, what remains of those, uh, of those plants in the calculus first, and then they match it with uh, the proteomic or genetic uh, uh, makeup of the of the sample. So uh, this is for paleobotanists, these amazing people. And uh, this is how, like, kind of what my data looks like. Sometimes I wish I, I was better in microscopy because it, it's so much more fun to look at the pictures. But uh, this is proteomic uh, results. So, so they found sesame, they found wheat or something that is related to wheat. Uh, basically the, yeah, yeah, grass that is related to wheat. And some, a banana or a relative of banana that's always complicated with proteomics. You, it's, sometimes it's hard to get very precise evidence, but you have general idea most of the time. Uh, or turmeric. So they uh, traded uh, uh, turmeric uh, over all, that long distance. So there was probably spice, uh, a spice trade going on. And the most interesting was soybean because they thought that uh, soybean was um, introduced much later uh, in time. So fascinating. Uh, another thing, like we studied food, but uh, you can also study famine and food during famine, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, for example, uh, here they studied um, basically what people ate at the time of the Great Famine uh, in the middle of 19th century in, in Ireland. And uh, they knew about potatoes and some like, yeah, like th there were plenty of plants they uh, took uh, into account and even like uh, milk from goats or um, 
uh, cows and so on. Uh, but they found ovalbumin, which is uh, a protein from eggs. And they thought that originally eggs were mostly shipped out of Ireland because they were quite expensive commodity. They were uh, just meant to um, be sold. Um, but they found that some of those people actually probably ate eggs as well. So it's, it's changing the, the way we, we look at some of these uh, bigger, uh, bigger things in human history. Uh, what happened? Okay, yeah. Or uh, very often studied is milk consumption uh, because there are a few very well studied um, proteins that we can find in dental calculus. So this is one, one of the many studies of, uh, of milk consumption in Eastern Africa, which is very uh, interesting, uh, especially in Neolithic uh, Africa. So they found uh, proteins from, from goats and from uh, sheep and from um, cows. Uh, and what is great about these proteins is that you can actually say if it was sheep or goat. And as all the archaeologists know, it's almost impossible to say uh, when you find, uh, for example, goat or sheep bones on the site, you, can, you have to say it's sheep goat or I don't know what, what was the English term. We, in Czech, we have this like sheep goats <laughs> because they're so closely related that just based on bones, it's probably almost impossible to say. You can study it by, by uh, DNA, but it might be harder to find their DNA in, uh, in the human calculus. But if you find the milk proteins, you might be able to say if it was goat or sheep or cow. So that's, total, that, that's a completely new tool that, that is given us. And uh, these samples are from the future publication <laughs> of mine. And um, yeah, I, I, I wish I could, I could show, show you more from my, my own uh, research. I showed you some of the DNA results, but if all the fun protomic results are... Uh, two top secrets to <laughs> share. So you, maybe next time, or uh, you can email me in a month and ask me if I already <laughs> finished the publication. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, but these are some, some of the samples that I study. Uh, they're from very interesting locations in the Czech Republic and also from the world. I, uh, I study, I, I really like to focus on pathogens, as, as I said, and on the diet, but anything I find can be part of my dissertation. So it's very wide and unfortunate for me. No, but uh, very fun for me, I wanted to say. Um, for example, here you can see the, the beautiful uh, green coloring. It's not fake. Uh, it's from grave goods. So. It's from Bronze Age. So I study Bronze Age as well. And yeah, so we'll see what I find. I, I already know, but you don't. <laughs> so you have to uh, write me an email or something. So it was a great pleasure giving this lecture. And I hope to, uh, I hope to um, yeah, give more in the future. <laughs> uh, of course, I had some sources from other publications because I couldn't, uh, you know, show all my unpublished data. Uh, but yeah, I was glad to be here. Thank you. Um. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this extremely interesting um, presentation, uh, Eva. Um, and first of all, I would like to say that, uh, well, the Sergius Grand project uh, started off as, a, as a, an emergency excavation, uh, where uh, me and Paulo were excavating and they were under some, well, typical commercial archaeology pressure to get things done. And it's very easy. Uh, and afterwards, the project evolved and eventually uh, now we have a 
uh, research project going on. Obviously, we focus on, on human skeletal remains, and so we are very interested in, in taking as much as information as possible from the human skeletal remains. But it's very easy for us um, overall to sometimes overlook uh, small details, uh, which end up not being that much small, nor details. They are actually quite uh, rich um, uh, traces of what happened in the past of our, of our past populations and so on. And so, first of all, I would like to thank you for giving us such a, a rich presentation and showing us how something such as small as dental calculus can tell us so much about our past populations. So everyone that is watching, please make sure to preserve as much as possible when we are doing excavations. Uh, even if it doesn't look that important, uh, it may hold valuable uh, treasures about the, the past populations that we have um, been excavating in research contexts or commercial archaeology or whatever. It's yeah. interesting because this, this process highly impacted asking samples from from um, for paleoparasitological analysis and so we always were um, conscious uh, conscious about the, the importance of keeping as much as possible and now your presentation even raises uh, one keep it as much as possible because yeah, Eva just gave us a wonderful example of uh, how the smallest, not so smallest and not so much a detail can bring us so much information. So thanks uh, for that. Um, and I have, uh, well, a couple of questions that I would like to ask, but probably there, were, there are other people that are uh, also anxious about asking questions. So uh, first of all, I would like to, well, ask if there are any questions that someone would like to, to ask Eva. Um, let's have a look at the, at the Facebook page. Okay, there's a question uh, already in Zoom. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I've missed it. Uh, and also sure. another one in Facebook, on, on Facebook. Okay, okay. Yeah, if, if ah. I can... <laughs> There's, here's here's one comment uh, yeah. about if this if this research is published. Uh, yeah. Most of the research I show today is not my research, so it is very published. Uh, and the research that was mine is also published. The one that I shown. Uh, you can wait. I can I can share the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I have the list of the publications that I uh, that I used uh, for this presentation. Ah. No, what's work? Okay, just like this. Uh, so for example, uh, the habit decoding by my colleague, uh, her name is Fialova, and she has multiple publication, publications on especially the, 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 the electron microscopy of calculus. Beautiful pictures, make sure to check it out. Uh, and uh, yeah, and th these are the that once I um, I spoke about I forgot to add my publication here for some reason, <laughs> but if you <laughs> I don't have that many so <laughs> if you put my last name uh, <laughs> not in Google but in some uh, scol uh, Google Scholar or something you'll you'll find that one publication but I'm afraid in, it's in Czech, uh, but. And also my my thesis was in Czech because it had to be. But um, yeah, if if you're interested, uh, you can email me. And once the uh, the like new publications, uh, the three that are uh, under preparations are uh, finished, I can I can send you maybe. So mm -hmm. yeah. So my stuff is not really published yet. That's PhD. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the things that I was going that I wanted to say first of all, which is we are all very anxious to see the publications coming out and with all your results. Um, okay, let me check the Facebook. Uh, I can page. read the, the question on Facebook if you want. Uh, okay, cheers. So the, the uh, question yes. is from At Achem. Sorry if I misspelled the name. 
So the question is, how far in, in nominal evolutionary history did the calculus start to appear? Did the calculus appear in any of the Australop Australopithecines or in great apes? Uh, thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your question. Yes, well, dental calculus is, how to say it? Um, it's basically a pathology. It's not an evolutionary trait that would be helpful for us in any way. And uh, basically anyone who has teeth, even fake teeth can have uh, dental calculus. So your dog can have dental calculus, uh, Tiber, uh, I mean, saber tooth tigers had calculus, uh, mammals definitely had calculus. Uh, like anyone who didn't brush their teeth enough, which I think that our ancestors uh, in evolution pretty much were, uh, could have calculus. The other thing is that um, in the past, lots of um, scientists just uh, scraped off the calculus because it looked like, um, sometimes it even looks like dirt kind of. So, so they would like to have beautiful, clean uh, skulls uh, that could be uh, mm -hmm. preserved chemically, especially, but even, even that can be studied, but when you scrape off the calculus, it's lost forever. But you can definitely see it in like Australopithecus if we could find such well-preserved samples. But but it's too old probably to study DNA. So maybe some proteins, I don't know. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that I'm missing, Bruno. I haven't checked no, any anymore. I okay. don't know if anyone here in Zoom has a question. I can enable the sound. Uh, so you can ask whatever you want. Uh, let's wait a, a few more seconds. So in the meantime, I have a very practical question, uh, which is how much quantity of calculus do you think uh, we need to do the analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's coming out in the publication. <laughs> no, oh. I'm joking. Yeah, we, we tested that actually. Uh, and it's, uh, we found out that very little, like so much less for the proteins that I have to use for DNA, for example. Um, I think the, I think one of the, is, is usually it, with calculus, it's always in milligrams. Uh, but I think my smallest samples are about like one, one to two milligrams. It's better to have slightly bigger around like five, six milligrams. But uh, when the calculus is, is like too big, sometimes the information is um, weird for some reason. We're trying to figure out why, but very little, like one piece of calculus from one tooth is enough for, for proteomics. Okay, okay. Uh, that's good to know <laughs> because yeah. sometimes we don't find that much calculus. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, uh, if we don't have further questions, I can I can ask one or two more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, then I, I will do that. Uh, then I'll do that. Okay, so um, you were saying that uh, what you find in dental calculus, either metagenomic or pro proteomic um, data, is a result of what we have in our mouths, of our oral microbiome. Uh, and so I was wondering how much is lost, how much information is lost about our oral microbiome um, in the process of the formation of dental calculus? Uh, do we lose a lot of information? Is it fairly um, complete information about the overall information of our oral microbiome? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, uh, well, uh, there's a great publication that I am not an author of, so uh, I can, yeah, I can advertise that. Um, very recently that compared uh, the bacterial composition of calculus, like recent calculus and plaque um, that is at the beginning of the formation. Uh, we know that uh, the bacterial composition changes uh, with even with maturation of maturation of the plaque. So uh, when you don't brush your teeth for the first day, you will have different bacteria in the plaque than if you don't brush your teeth for a week because some of the bacteria uh, that need oxygen 
can survive in the deeper structure of uh, of the plaque and then later calculus. So uh, uh, what we call uh, anaer anaerobic, so don't need oxygen, don't need air, bacteria uh, survive better under those conditions. So we will have different composition on, on, uh, on in the top layer and different underneath. So it changes very much even in the first stage before it gets um, before it gets uh, mineralized. Uh, but I, I don't work with recent samples and this, because we don't have like ancient plug, which is half calculus, uh, that's better to, to look at um, in publications about the recent ones. But there definitely is one, I think that came up last year. I don't remember, um, I don't remember the name of it, but it's there, yeah. So it changes, we don't know. I don't think we will know how much because microbiome is uh, in like in the center of attention for many microbiologists and uh, it, like everyone is trying to think about their gut microbiome and so on. So, so we're just learning about all of this and we don't even know how much information we, we lose between sampling and when we get the sample to a machine to read all the DNA. So there's way too many questions for way too many PhD students in the future. <laughs> there's so much to study. <laughs> so plenty of plenty of work to be done then. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Landa Juarez Erika Itzel. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Was thank you very was thanking you Eva and asking you for email. Maybe then you, you can share. Uh, she says that she works at the National Institute of History and Archaeology. I'm not sure which this which one this is. Maybe we can you can give um, Landa. Uh, where is it? Um, and uh, she's also asking if it is possible to find some kind of medicine in dental calculus. Yeah, I'm working on that too, actually. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. But the tricky thing is that the medicine uh, would have to be taken in the quite, quite recent days or months before the person died and uh, in very great quantities. And like from my experience, it's only by chance that these molecules are preserved. We like even if you drink a lot of milk, you have no um, like hundred uh, percent chance that you will find find milk in the in the dental calculus. Uh, so I am very excited to see if we can find some traces uh, of the medicine uh, in the calculus from um, from the symmetry that I mentioned because most of those are patients, and so, some of them some. Like we we also have some people that were like beheaded because there was uh, that station just nearby. But uh, most of them are are patients from nearby hospital. Uh, yeah, so so I hope medicine can be found. Uh, it depends on the methods that you use. Uh, by DNA, probably not. By proteins, it depends if the medicine could have some protein makeup as well. Uh, but I'm looking into elemental traces uh, of. Um, of some medicines, but I can't say more. But I'm looking ele at elemental traces of some pretty awful medicines in history. <laughs> so I, I hope so. And uh, I can definitely like should I should I write my email in the in the yeah. chat in the chat? Yeah. 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 Okay. So so yeah. anyone, if you're interested uh, in cooperation, <laughs> no, it's uh, it's really interesting, uh, and I'm. I'll be happy to uh, send you some publications or anything that you that you might need. Uh, can you are... ask a question? If I can... Sorry, uh, sorry, Bruno. Can I Did ask you... a question? Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, let me ask this last question in the context of Sardinus Grandes. Uh, individual 12, uh, with the, the, the one uh, with the highest amount of calculus, also must have had a smallpox uh, since a young age. Um, this is what uh, bones show, show us. So can you search for something in dental calcul calculus uh, specifically related to a disease or to its treatment 
uh, for instance, in this in this case related uh, to smallpox. I'll be happy happy to look at that sample when I come <laughs> in two months, but um, it depends. Like if if this individual died of smallpox, or if he had smallpox like twenty years before mm -hmm. he died, because cal uh, like we don't really know how long it takes uh, for calculus to form. It's very individual. It depends on so many factors, including your diet and uh, your genetic makeup, because some people just have um, like faster mineralization of plaque. Um, whatever they do, they just get uh, dental calculus even if they brush their teeth. Uh, so it, it really depends. Like if, if it's a child that died of smallpox, there's very good chance that there will be, uh, or that, no, it's, that it's there could adult. be some. It's an adult female. Yeah, yeah. So then probably. Well, there's no yeah. way of knowing if she died yeah. of smallpox or. Yeah. But uh, yeah. we can. Uh, we can try to search for some. Yeah, well, the, uh, the good thing about uh, looking at all the bacteria or, 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 or all the like proteins in the calculus is that we can find even stuff that we did that we weren't looking for. So maybe she had smallpox, uh, like, um, oh boy, I forgot a word. Sorry, it's pretty late here, yeah. late at night. Um, earlier in life, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and maybe her immune reactions were not so great. And then she died of like different pathogen that you could find in dental calculus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, go I'm gonna use uh, your question in your answer, um, uh, your question, Bruno, in your answer, Eva, uh, to um, ask something that is related to this. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we find traces of non-specific infectious pr um, processes in um, in bones. So, so bone develops a reaction which causes woven bone to form and we don't know exactly what what was causing that uh, reaction so my question to you is do you think it would be enriching to use metagenomics uh, probably proteomics to try to understand what could be causing those non-specific re um, um, infectious reactions absolutely like uh, absolutely it's uh, like part of what took me to proteins was my um, frustration from trying to find uh, DNA of um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the, the causing agent of tuberculosis. So yeah, I, I, I believe so. And um, like, I think it's very interesting to study uh, all these individuals based on paleo uh, anthropology uh, of um, like uh, to look at how the bones were changed uh, by the disease but sometimes yeah it's frustrating when you have these non-specific things and and you can just say like even even when it looks like tuberculosis you can say it maybe was tuberculosis because there's this incredible list of what other stuff it could be including I don't know brucellosis and like yeah all, all the other stuff so uh, I believe that the proteomics of this could also be used on bones, not just calculus, but but also uh, the specific lesions maybe uh, that are presented by bac yeah. bacteria or the immune reaction. So definitely, definitely. Yeah. So maybe even sample a bit of the, the woven bone itself. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. I, I kind of try that during my PhD, but I... Uh, yeah, I shouldn't do much more than calculus because it's PhD and I, I'm going too broad already. So my supervisor is, yeah. Focus, <laughs> she, Eva, she's, focus. Yeah, yeah she's, she's not excited about how wide my interests are. <laughs> she said well, that when I fin in, in a year, when I finish my PhD, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but that means you have a very, very large list of uh, things you can pick up from once you finish your PhD, which is always yeah. good. Yeah, that's plenty. Yeah, plenty. <laughs> great, great. Um, Bruno, I don't know if we have any more questions. We're an hour after starting. Um, if we should wrap it up or... Uh, sorry, uh, not on Facebook. And I think not on Zoom too. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if if you can like post my email also on the uh, maybe in the Facebook chat. I don't know if if people on Facebook can see my email that I posted here. Uh, yeah, if I if anyone has. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I think okay. this video will also be posted later on um, on YouTube, and I think we I think we maybe can also include your email there. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah. no problem. So there it will be. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. Excited to hear all the questions from all the exciting <laughs> excited people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we can, well, thank you, Eva, once again, for taking our invitation, for accepting our invit invitation, bringing us such an interesting and rich um, presentation. And uh, we'll be looking forward to see those publications. You really, really teased us. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> so, uh, I'm looking forward to see the, um, the presentations. And, well, maybe once we have some results of your research, um, with, uh, hopefully with uh, remains from Cerillos, maybe a second uh, presentation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. The future, yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Thanks for okay. giving me this opportunity. Have oh, a great. It's, it's our pleasure. Day. And <laughs> thanks again. Thanks everyone for joining and for um, watching the, the presentation of, of Eva. Um, and soon. And thanks to everyone again. Bruno, I don't know if you have something to. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much.